Good day YouTube, Wobbles on a lot here. Welcome to the fourth video in my little series on uh, what it means to being sop with camelology. And today we're going to dip, not for the first time in this series, into this brand new book that I got for my birthday. And it's so hot off the presses that have a look at this. This being the cover of the January 2020 Sea Mail copy of Aeroplane magazine which appeared in my newsagent on Friday and inside the magazine Annette Carson herself has written her own abridged teaser extract of her excellent book and I suppose if I wanted to I could take the lazy option and read all this to camera straight out of the magazine, which I suppose you might say could be called a book review. But because I have put kind of 50 years into thinking about this issue and a couple of weeks into thinking about how to make it as a movie series for my little YouTube channel, I think I'm going to keep on going as I had planned. So let's take it from here. You look at this painting of an event which many many people saw Armstrong do on many many occasions and a person's initial response is to think this guy's nuts he's going to kill himself well yeah I knew a pilot like that once the first time I met him I saw him fly and I thought this guy's crazy he's going to he's going to die and then I watched him do it again a couple of times that day and again a couple of times the next day and I thought well holy shit, he's still alive. And then a year later, I come back and I met him again and he was still doing it. And I figured out, well, he knows what he's doing. He just likes doing it anyway. And I accepted the fact that that's what some people do with their aeroplanes. Well, today, if you saw someone doing that, you'd expect them to be locked up as soon as they landed if they didn't crash and die in the attempt. That's not what happened to Captain D.V. Armstrong. At the time, the fact that he had mastered the Sopwith Camel to the point where he could do stuff like this on a regular basis, predictably, he said safely, it was exactly what the authorities wanted because Sopwith Camels at the time had a reputation for being death traps for all of the reasons that we covered in the first three videos in the series. Okay, you content yourself with looking at that as a visual graphic, and I'm going to read from the Sea Bacristote. And this is from Annette Carson's book. The death toll in the training schools to qualify on the camel in England was worrying, and morale was understandably at a low ebb. Yet the camel was a remarkable success in France. In order to restore confidence, De Urban Armstrong, whose magnificent flying of the camel had become legendary, was withdrawn from his squadron, and he was sent round the schools to demonstrate and describe how the machine could be mastered. His efforts bore fruit, and the flow of trained camel pilots was restored. Armstrong's ability in stunting now termed aerobatics was truly wonderful to watch. Cecil Lewis added his voice to the growing admiration. Many times he saw DVA, that's Durban Victor Armstrong, go straight into his loop on takeoff, a favourite trick that never ceased to amaze. Quote, everyone who saw him would agree that Armstrong was the finest pilot in the force, he averred. He was a past master at that most dangerous and spectacular business of stunting near the ground. In case it should be supposed that the difficulty of flying the sop with camel was exaggerated, the following is extracted from the well-known diary attributed to Lieutenant John McGavick Gridder, an American waiting for his commission in the Royal Flying Corps in March 1918, after the Sopwith Camel had been in service with the Corps for a good nine months. His unit was at the School of Aerial Fighting in Air, Scotland, when six American naval pilots arrived to take the course on camels, thinking they were as easy to handle as the Hanrios they'd been flying in France. Three of them were killed. Then an American instructor who had 300 hours on courtesies in the USA spun a camel into the ground and killed himself. The next day, another man died the same way. And before he could be buried, 
Two English pilots also killed themselves, all in camels and all doing right hand spins. The attrition rate during pilot training described by Gritter was truly horrifying. This high rate of casualties to camel trainees was common to all training schools, so the average young student was well aware of its reputation and approached it with fear. It has been estimated the camel killed some 350 trainees, but official figures for this are lacking. In a snapshot survey of home-based, i.e. non-combat camel casualties, whether in training or otherwise, out of the 516 crashes surveyed, nearly 50%, or 229, were attributed to spinning, of which 167 resulted in death. So to briefly dip back into Macmillan's book, Great Aircraft, there were 5,490 camels built, 1,294 enemy victories shot down by camels, uh, allegedly 350 trainees were killed by camels. Out of 516 crashes of camels in Britain, 229 of them spun in, and of the 229 that spun in, 167 deaths. So you could possibly say that spinning in killed half the camel pilots who were killed in training, perhaps triangulating, cross-referencing over the sources. This sombre reality prompted the urgent need to demonstrate to trainee and transitioning pilots the true nature of the camel and encourage them to embrace its potential while instilling due respect for its unforgiving propensities if mishandled. Smith Barry's innovative school at Gosport was designed to produce instructors properly trained in stunting, but it was not until quite late in the war that they started coming through and then not in sufficient numbers to provide widespread training on advanced machines. And meanwhile, the need for men skilled enough to handle them in combat was relentless. So demonstrations by someone like DVA were crucial in spreading confidence and fostering the belief that the camel could be a responsive, rewarding mount and a deadly effective gun platform. Unfortunately, despite its many advances over previous machines and its delightful agility once mastered, there were hidden design flaws in the camel which were never fully appreciated until its service life was over. As pointed out by Wing Commander Norman Macmillan, OBE, MC, AFC, DL, in his book Great Aircraft, quote, there was something about a camel which could elude even the greatest experts among pilots. Time after time, the camel would perform manoeuvres with identical results, but on the 10th or 20th, or perhaps the 50th time, it would behave differently. Macmillan was well acquainted with the aircraft, having been a flight commander and a flying instructor in the First World War. Into, in another book, Into the Blue, he proposed a simple reason which could have accounted for many camel crashes, and we will to re return to discuss this in Chapter 9. Why don't we have a little bit of uh, consideration given to this? It's a novel, but it's a novel written by a sop with camel pilot who survived flying sop with camels in 1918 for a full six, seven months. A tour of operations, as they would call it in a later war. And in this semi-autobiographical novel, he describes what it was like his first time flying a camel. Might put things into a bit of perspective, if that makes sense. Flying camels was not everyone's work. They were by far the most difficult of service machines to handle. Note there, in his experience. Many pilots killed themselves by crashing in a right hand spin when they were learning to fly them. A camel hated an inexperienced hand and flopped into a frantic spin at the least opportunity. They were unlike ordinary aeroplanes, being quite unstable, immoderately tail heavy, so light on the controls that the slightest jerk or inaccuracy would hurl them all over the sky, difficult to land, deadly to crash, a list of vices to emasculate the stoutest courage. And the first flight on a camel was always a terrible ordeal. 
They were bringing out, out a two-seater training camel for dual work in the hope of reducing that 30% of crashes on the first solo flights. Tom very well remembered his own first effort. Baker, his instructor, had given him a preliminary lecture. I suppose you haven't run a Clerget engine before. It was a Clerget camel. You'll find it just like a Lerone. You've taken up the Lerone pup, haven't you? You'll find it a bit fierce to start with. You've got an extra 40 horsepower and plenty more revs. You'll soon get to like that. Be careful with your fine adjustment. They're a bit tricky on that. Ease it back as much as you can as soon as you're off the ground, and the higher you get, the less juice you'll find she wants. I expect you've heard all about flying them. Be careful of your rudder. You might find it a bit difficult to keep straight at first. Keep just a shade of left rudder on to counteract the twist to the right. When you're on anything like full throttle, you can feel the engine pulling to the right all the time. Remember to use the rudder as little as possible. You hardly want any when you turn. But don't be afraid of putting on plenty of bank. A camel's an aeroplane, not a house with wings, and you can put them over vertical and back again quicker than you can say it. I expect you'll find three-quarter throttle or so best for getting used to it. Keep her between 80 and 90 at first. Don't get wind up and you'll be quite happy. Getting wind up means being scared. Now this is what I want you to do. Take your time in running the engine on the ground so as to get used to it. Then go straight up to 5,000, all up, all out. You'll be up there in no time. You're not to turn or do anything except ease the fine adjustment back below 5,000 feet. Climb at 85. Then you can try turning to the left, all out or throttle down, just as you like. Don't be afraid of spinning. If you do spin, you know how to get out. Pull off the petrol and give her plenty of opposite rudder and stick. Have the stick well forward, but don't keep it too far forward when she's coming out or you'll dive like hell and lose a lot of height and jerk yourself about and Lord knows what. Tom had got in and run the engine. There wasn't any difficulty about that. He taxied out and turned around. The wind being easterly, he had to take off over the hangers. He opened the throttle and the engine roared. Then it spluttered. Hell. He caught a glimpse of people jumping about with excitement. Too much petrol. His hand went to the fine adjustment. By the time he had got the engine running properly, he was almost into a hangar with his tail hardly off the ground. He pulled the stick back and staggered into the air, just clearing the roof. If the engine gave one more splutter, he would stall and crash. But the engine continued to roar uniformly. His heart, having missed several beats, thumped away to make up for them, and he felt emulsified but he was flying. The engine was pulling like a chain typhoon. He seemed to be going straight up, 2,000 feet, and he'd only just staggered above the hangars. It was difficult to hold the thing down at all. The slightest relaxation of forward pressure on the stick would point it at the very zenith. The day was excellent for flying, there being no wind or bumps. A grey mist was still weakly investing the world, limiting the field of vision, wrapping the horizon in obscurity. At his back, the southwesterly sun was touching the greyness and transmuting it into a haze of golden light, blinding to peer into, in front of the mist hung like a solid but unattainable wall, ending abruptly in a straight line at some three or four thousand feet, and on it stood the base of the pale grey-blue vault of the sky, seeming only a degree less solid. He soon became aware that he was not flying straight. At first, the sensation peculiar to sideslipping had been lost in the major sensation of flying a strange machine. But when his senses were less bewildered by the strangeness of it, he became aware of a side wind, of a secondary vibration within the normal vibration of the engine, of that particular feeling of wrongness that is associated with sideslipping. He had seen beginners doing this sort of thing. A few days previously, someone had taken off on a camel and gone across the aerodrome almost like a flying crab while everybody held, everybody held their breath and waited for the side slip to become a spin and the pilot a corpse. But he had got away with it. Tom had been scornful at the time, but here he was doing much the same sort of thing. He had no idea why. He could fly any ordinary aeroplane straight enough. He experimented with the rudder, but soon came to the conclusion that side slipping was an ineluctable vice of camels. At any rate of this one, it would not fly straight for more than a second at a time.
At 5,000 feet, he put the machine on a level keel in order to try a turn, but flying level brought such an increase of speed and fierceness that he was constrained to throttle down the engine considerably before he could bring himself to put on bank. Then, very carefully, he pressed the stick towards the left and the rudder gently the same way. What happened was that all tension went out of the controls. There was an instant of steep side slip and the earth whizzed around in front of him. A spin! At once, his hand went to the fine adjustment to shut off the petrol. Full forward opposite stick and rudder stopped the spinning, but he found himself diving vertically and side slipping badly at the same time. He had fallen from the seat and was hanging in the belt. He pulled himself back into the seat by means of the joystick and set about getting out of the dive. Gradually, he brought the nose up to the horizon or where it was hidden in the mist and restarted the engine, which roared away furiously. Looking at the pito, he found the speed was 120, so he eased the stick back and climbed. For some minutes, he didn't care to do anything but fly as straight as he could, and it cost him an effort of will to decide to try again to turn. This time he was ready for a spin, and as soon as he felt the controls going soft, he came out of the turn. By this means, he succeeded in turning through a few degrees without actually spinning, and after a few more such turns, he let his strong desire to get back to the earth have its way. He made out that he was some way east of Croydon and it was necessary to turn west. To do this, he shut off the engine and brought the machine round in a long, sweeping glide. The thing would turn on the glide without spinning. Anyhow, that was something. He flew towards the sun until he judged the aerodrome must be close ahead, though it was invisible in the golden haze, and stopped the engine again and soon found himself gliding over the aerodrome at a thousand feet. He started the engine throttled right down and buzzed the engine on the thumb switch. To get into the aerodrome, he had to perform another complete half turn, which he did on the glide, not without some qualms about the nearness of the ground. He wouldn't have stopped up any longer for all the wealth of all jewellery. He would never make a camel pilot. He would give up flying and go back to the PBI. Poor bloody infantry. He drifted on downwards to land, approaching the aerodrome correctly from leeward, but rather fast, being afraid of stalling and spinning into the ground. He floated across the aerodrome. He suddenly realised he would never get in. His wheels touched the ground and he bounced like a kangaroo. Desperately, he opened the throttle. The engine spluttered. He was heading for that same hangar again. He would hit it this time. He moved the fine adjustment and the engine roared. He pulled up and once more staggered over the roof, having caught a glimpse of Baker shaking a fist at him. He held on this way shakily up to 3,000 feet and then shut off the engine and glided back. This time he hardly reached the aerodrome at all and opened the throttle, but the engine wouldn't pick up. He floated, he just floated over the boundary hedge and pancaked onto the rough ground at the edge of the aerodrome. Luckily, the undercarriage stood it. His prop stopped, and he sat there waiting for mechanics to come and swing it, safe, profoundly glad to be back on earth, but feeling a perfect fool. It took the mechanics a long time to reach him, and that gave Baker time to cool down. All he said was, well, how'd you like it? Oh, not too bad, Tom lied. I spun turning. You'll soon get over that, but for the love of heaven, don't do that comic, comic taking off act of yours anymore or you'll smash the only camel I've got left and we'll have to scrape you off with a knife. Okay, right. So that's what your average student pilot transitioning from the Avro 504K trainer onto the camel was likely to experience on their very first go at it. And as it mentioned, 30% of them crashed on their first solo in a camel. So one asks oneself the question, how does it come to be that this particular bloke, Durban Victor Armstrong, was in such a different kettle of fish? He met the camel, and as far as he was concerned, this was the perfect aeroplane, aeroplane to practice aerobatics in. Who is he? Where did he come from? And what was he doing before he got onto the camels? Fair point, eh? Hey? First matter, that crazy name, Durban. Who the hell calls their kid Durban? George Shearer Armstrong. That's who names his kid Urban. The kid was born on the 26th of July 1897 and named after Sir Benjamin de Urban, in whose honour the town itself had been named. He was known in the family as Urban.
captioned Rural Zululand in the early 1900s. Young Durban Victor Armstrong was packed off to the Hilton College in Pietermaritzburg when he was eight years old. And what they call their preparatory school. There he is there. Like your upper class boarding schools all over the British Empire, he got to play a fair bit of football. And he was an extra young prefect. Played more feet ball. And he saw a Blerio fly in 1911. His big brother, Athel, joined the Natal Mounted Rifles and 8th South African Horse, first seeing action age 21 against the Zulu Rebellion of 1906-1907. In this photograph, Athel with the cane is on the left. He's been wounded in a rebellion in the 10th of August 1914 with the Natal Mounted Rifles. What they called the Maritz Rebellion, whose outbreak led to martial law being imposed in October 1914. A revolt by a section of the Boer population against the South African government's participation in the First World War on the British side, on the grounds that they had received German sympathy for the Africana cause in the Anglo-Boer hostilities. Young Durban, seen here on the right, joined the Natal Mounted Rifles underwent training and service between December 1914 and October 1915 at the rank of second lieutenant. January 1915, the official formation of the South African Aviation Corps was gazetted. And by the 23rd of October 1915, Durban Armstrong was recorded as a member of the South African Aviation Corps with the rank of second lieutenant. At the same time that number 26 squadron was being formed, any details of his service in South Africa seem to have disappeared without trace. He underwent his basic training November 15 to February 16, all back before the Battle of the Somme, learning to fly on the Morris Farman Longhorn and the Morris Farman Shorthorn. 19th of February 1916, Durban went to receive further training at Gosport, Hampshire, later the home of the famous instructor school. Here in the instructional squadron, he transitioned to tractor biplanes, the 80 horsepower rotary gnome powered Avro and the Royal Aircraft Factory built BE2C, which employed the familiar air cooled Renault V8. The BE2C trainers in use at Gosport since 1915 were the early models with a 70 horsepower Renault. When the BE2C went to war, it lost its skids and gained more power. Stable and easy to fly from the pilot's point of view, it had genuinely effective ailerons, as opposed to the wing warping retained in earlier BE models. BE signifying Blerio experimental tractor types. He would soon discover that it was actually capable of vertically banked turns. Armstrong narrowly missed, avoided, managed not to get posted to a squadron of FE-2Bs, which in 1916 were considered fighters. Reading from the text, doubtless the newly qualified Armstrong was as keen as any young man to get to the action as soon as possible, but fate intervened in the person of Captain J.G. Jacob Swart, M.C., Military Cross, a 22-year-old flight commander, as noted in DVA's photo album, in which the above FE-2Bs appear. Quote, I very nearly went out to France on these things early in 1916, but Captain Swart, a South African from Joburg, told me I hadn't sufficient experience and got me off. While based at Gosport, number 22 squadron had become the parent squadron from which a nucleus of pilots was drawn to form number 45 squadron. On 19 March, the day before 22 squadron's departure, he was transferred to 45 squadron, which to his pleasure was starting to be worked up with scouts, Martinsides and Bristols. This meant he continued at Gosport for some weeks while 45 squadron waited endlessly to be deployed to France but it was, this was delayed until October when it was eventually sent out on SOP with one and a half strutters. Rather than being left to kick his heels, Armstrong was meanwhile transferred to another Gosport unit, number one reserve squadron, based on the other side of the airfield at Fort Grange. Commanded by Captain Charles Gordon Bell, famed holder of RAEC ticket number 100. This newly created squadron was to carry out a systematic training on the full gamut of aircraft available at the station, ranging from preliminary to advanced, all of which 
Armstrong was well acquainted with. Slightly touched up photograph of um, DVA's forced landing with the Moraine. Having built up experience on the trickier scout machines, Armstrong was singled out for his piloting abilities and soon became gainfully employed, assisting in the process of passing on skills to novice pilots who had fewer hours than himself. Such activities, training and encouraging others would form a repeated pattern throughout his flying career. He certainly spent a great deal of time in the air around this time in April, May 1916, and by his next posting, he had perfected his skills while increasing his 13 hours to 90. He nearly got sent to France with 13 hours total time aloft. This is a particularly famous Moraine Solnier Type G, uh, pictured at Cambridge in 1914. It belonged to Gustav Hamel. Hamel's exhibitions with this machine included inverted flight and loops, for which one of the most conspicuous alterations was that to the bracing pylons, cabanes, which were made taller to increase the angle of the bracing cables to the upper wing surfaces, thereby reducing the tension in the cables which enabled them to meet higher loads. As late as May 1916, Gustav Hamel's Moraine was lent to 60 Squadron shortly before that celebrated unit went to France, so although he didn't ferry Hamel's Moraine, it is one that Armstrong would have flown in training. These nimble moraines were the forerunner of the Type N bullet on which Balfour and Armstrong would shortly find themselves at the front in their first posting to France with the RFC. These were fairly tricky and difficult to pilot, Balfour continued, but until he has flown an underpowered middle wing monoplane such as these or a Blériot, no pilot has tasted the real sensation of flight. Tossed about in the air like a leaf in the wind, with the white wings outstretched on either side, man comes nearest to feeling like a bird on the wing. This is a moraine bullet, one of the famous ones which had a set of V-shaped steel deflector blades U-bolted to the propeller root so that the solid copper bullets would bounce off because they hadn't invented an interrupter gear. Reading from Annabelle Carson's book, being sent to the front with only a dozen hours solo was not such an unusual occurrence, especially for a pilot who showed early promise. Cecil Lewis, who was to become a well-known writer and broadcaster, had joined the RFC straight from school and learned on shorthorns along with DVA Lewis, who was with him at Gosport in number 22 squadron at the age of 17, and actually did find himself sent to France in March 1916 with just 13 hours. His inexperience left him hopelessly ill-equipped, but fortunately for Lewis, he was held back from the front for some weeks, otherwise his brief flying career would probably have been cut short soon after it started. With the certainty of youth, he was convinced he would come through at all, but the time was soon approaching when the average age, the average length of a novice pilot's life at the front could be measured in weeks. Probably a black and white photograph of a painting, perhaps from the front of a Revel model aeroplane box, but you clearly have a Fokker Eindecker and a Moraine bullet. By the time of the Battle of the Somme, which began in June, there was such heavy toll of pilots bearing the brunt of the onslaught that their replacements were being rushed out from England, no matter what their state of pre preparation. Overstretched already, there was insufficient time or opportunity for the frontline squadron commanders to train them, and in the main they were left to fend for themselves as best they could. As the experienced pilots lost their comrades one by one, they took their pick of the better performing aeroplanes for themselves and left the unreliable, battle-worn machines for the newcomers. No deliberate callousness was intended, but there was always a degree of bitterness at the loss of fine fighting men and a feeling of almost resentment towards these callow, untrained youngsters whom the War Office policy demanded be sent as replacements for irreplaceable companions in arms. Training for the newcomers often consisted of placing them at tail end positions and instructing them not to stray, though simply keeping up with the rest was difficult enough when your machine was the runt of the pack. There you go. I knew I had a really good photograph of a Moraine Solnia bullet. This is it. We see how Cecil Lewis and Armstrong were sort of running intertwined careers. Cecil Lewis was lucky. On arrival in France, he was kept back at number one aircraft depot St. Omer, which was, until the end of March, the headquarters of General Officer Commanding the RFC, Major General Sir Hugh Boom Trenchard. 
deep voice. St. Omer was the main centre for aircraft testing and supply where the ferry pilots were stationed. The role of test and ferry pilot was later to be one of Armstrong's jobs. Working between St. Omer and Farnborough for the first half of 1917, but this was not until after he had spent an arduous seven months at the front with number 60 squadron. Lewis's spell at St. Omer did not last long, but he managed to gain a dozen more hours and a great deal more confidence, being encouraged to get into the air as much as possible. Whilst there, he was introduced to two of the infamous rotary-engined Moraine Solmia family of aircraft, which were regarded by many, including himself, as among the most difficult of all the machines being flown at that time. Lewis still had only 20 hours when at last his posting came to an active squadron, but not on the single-seater scouts he longed to fly. Instead, Instead, he was sent to number nine squadron flying BE-2Cs. His flight commander, scandalised at his lack of experience, insisted that he take his machine up and fly it all day, map reading and getting the lie of the land. Familiarisation with the locality was standard practice for recent arrivals, but not all newcomers were afforded Lewis's 10 hours of vital preparation, especially once the Somme offensive was underway. Cecil Lewis's career in many ways paralleled that of D.V. Armstrong. Not always at the same time or in the same squadron, but Lewis and Armstrong served out their war as contemporaries in a sequence that involved them in similar duties at similar periods, initially even on similar machines. After training together, both men would go on to spend the latter half of 1916 at the front on Moraine Solnia monoplanes, going right through the Somme offensive. Armstrong with number 60 squadron, Lewis with number 3 squadron, followed by a period on testing and ferrying duties. In 1917, for a short time, they were on active service together in number 44 squadron on home defence, flying sop with camels. Lewis joining a little after Armstrong, who was in, its forma in at its formation. Both were outstanding pilots and seasoned fighters by then, and both were to end their war as exponents of the newly devised art of night fighting. Okay, so Armstrong spent six months flying these things, Moraine bullets. And from what I can make out, the Moraine bullet was just about as, well, it was more nasty than the Moraine parasol. And both the parasol and the, mono, the bullet were nastier than the biplane. But all the Moraines featured a single factor that made them just horrible to fly. And that was a single piece moving tailplane with no horizontal stabilizer. This is a Moraine biplane. And just in there is the control horn, which operates the entire elevator surface. It doesn't hinge, it's pivoted along the spar. And the whole thing moves as one piece. It's the same on the Moraine Parasol, which was a two-seater. It's the same with the Moraine Bullet. Note here, the entire elevator. Here's another Moraine Bullet. It's whole elevator. The whole thing does that. Okay. Let's just dip into what Cecil Lewis has to say about the Moraines. Moraines were French machines. You could see that as soon as you looked at one. It was something in the design, difficult to put a finger on, rakish, rather stylish, and yet somehow different, in the way that a Bugatti or a Delage is different. There were three types. A little single-seater scout, the monocoque, a devil to fly. It landed at about 70. The biplane, a venomous looking brute of a two-seater, like a dragonfly, with a long thin body and two square cut wings well forward. It was sometimes mistaken for and attacked as a Hun. And the parasol. The parasol was the queerest looking of the lot. She was a two-seater monoplane. The wing was carried above the body and well above it, hence the nickname. And you sat under the wing in the fattish circular fuselage which looked rather like a stump of a good cigar. She was a tractor, of course, and carried a rotary engine in the red-hot end of the stump. The rotary was an 80-horsepower Lerone. It was a beauty, the sweetest running rotary ever built. 
It throttled down and ticked over like a water-cooled stationery and was as smooth as silk over its whole range. At full out, it had a happy note like a homing bee. Also, it was as reliable as a sewing machine. None of the Moraines had any tailplane. Most aeroplanes, this for the uninitiated, have a fixed tailplane with a movable flap on the back of it, the elevator. So if you take your hand off the elevator, the control stick, the elevator just remains where it is, streaming out behind the tailplane. And if the machine is adjusted correctly, it will fly on level, hands off. But the moraine contented itself with the elevator, the movable flap only. And this elevator was a balanced elevator. That is, it carried some of the surface ahead of its fulcrum. The technicalities don't really matter. The result was that the elevator was as sensitive as a gold balance. I know I'm reading about the parasol, but we're talking about somebody who spent his first tour of the front flying monoplanes, so we'll just change the picture. The least movement stood you on your head or on your tail. You couldn't leave the machine to its own device for a moment. You had to fly it every second you were in the air. The other controls, just to make it more difficult, were practically non-existent. There was a rudder, too small to get you around quickly, and ailerons which were so inefficient that sometimes, if you got a bump under one wing taking off, it was literally seconds before you could get the machine on an even keel again. Okay, be happy about that because the parasol had ailerons. Unlike the monocoque, which did not. The monocoque just had wing warping. As a final complication, the stick, which in any respectable aeroplane stands up straight and at a comfortable height to get a hold of, was short. It did not come above the knees and had a grip on top like half a shooting stick into which you slipped your hand. If you were foolish enough to let go of this in the air, the stick fell forward with a crack against the tank and the machine went straight into a nosedive. Never, even when you knew the machine inside out, could you relax for a second. I think I've said enough for the reader, whether he knows anything about flying or not, to realise that the moraine really was a death trap. Thoroughly dangerous to fly, needing the greatest care and skill, the lightest hands and the most accurate judgement to land. After 19 hours solo, mostly on two seas and shorthorns, I did not relish the job. Subsequently, I flew every machine used by the Air Force during the war. They were all child's play after the Moraine. Okay, so this is taken from uh, Lewis describing after his instructor, Patrick, had just taken him for a fly around the field in the two-seat Moraine parasol, showing him how it works and getting out. Remember, he said, Watch your elevator. As soon as you open up, push the stick forward. The tail will lift at once, and then you can ease her off. Easier said than done, for when I obeyed these instructions, I found the tail shoot up over my head in a flash. And when I jerked back the stick in a panic, it slumped down onto the ground with a heavy crunch. I pushed the stick forward again. Up went the tail. I pulled it back. Down it came. By this time, I had flying speed, so the last pullback did not bring the tail down onto the ground with a thud, it lifted the machine into the air, pretty well stalling it. So I staggered, bucketing across the aerodrome, giving a passable imitation of a scenic railway. Oh, that balanced elevator. Don't turn under 500 feet, said Patrick. I was up to a thousand before I had got the hang of the elevator. But when I got to the squadron, I found that one of the unwritten orders, no pilot ever, however experienced, however elated, would take any liberties with a parasol under 500 feet. I flew on. Once the breathless excitement of getting off was over, I began to feel easier. The machine was snug and warm. It seemed fairly normal on turns. I wandered about for a bit, tried the gliding angle, played with the engine controls, and came down to land. I don't believe the Schneider Trophy Racer is any more difficult to land than a parasol was. There was just one place, and one only in the float, where the stick had to be firmly and quickly drawn back to your stomach. If you missed that point, you bounced. The undercarriage was weak, the V pieces buckled, and over you went. In a high wind, even when you were down, a gust would lift the parasol right off the ground again and blow it over like a toy. 
To prevent this, the mechanics used to come running out onto the aerodrome, judge where you would land, and rush to catch a hold of the lift wires under the wings where they hung on, swinging one on each wingtip while you taxied in. However, I was lucky that day, for I got down with only a couple of bounces. The V pieces held, I taxied in. Okay, so that is what Durban Victor Armstrong spent six months flying in 1916 before he came back from the front after doing his first tour of duty, tour of operations, trip to France, whatever they wanted to call it. Six months flying something that was vastly worse than the camel. He had experience as a ferrying test pilot, acceptance pilot before he went on active service. Just like Cecil Lewis, Armstrong was lucky enough to get extra time. He was held back by someone who could see that he had ability, but he needed a bit of final polishing before you sent him out there and let him try to survive while people were shooting at him when he was just barely managing to stay enough in front of the aeroplane to get it off the ground and bring it back without breaking it as long as nothing went wrong. Those of you who pay attention to the fine details will notice that the camel had the opposite character tray compared to the moraines. The moraines with their all moving tailplanes, if you let go of the joystick on them, they would dive for the ground and nearly spit you out of the cockpit. Whereas the camel, because it was designed and rigged to be tail heavy as long as it had any fuel in the fuel tank, if you let go of the stick on a camel, it will pull up into the start of a loop. If you release the forward pressure on the stick of a camel, it will tighten up in turns, which is both things that you really, really, really want to be happening in a dogfight. The camel also had big ailerons. They weren't differential ailerons, but they were big. And it had a small vertical stabilizer and a small horizontal stabilizer. So, as it said in one of the passages, the camel was all control and no stability. But it was a whole lot better than a moraine. And 130 to 150 horsepower, although, as we'll see later, if you had a 110 horsepower engine and a different propeller with a coarser pitch, you actually got better performance out of your camel, possibly because the 110 horsepower engine was lighter than the 130 or 150 horsepower. But anyway, the 110 horsepower Lerone was the best camel of the lot. And I'm going to say that this brings us to the end of the fourth video, and we haven't even started descriptions of Armstrong's aerobatics or what seems to have gone wrong on Armstrong's final flight. Sorry about that if you feel that it's a bit of a drawn out shaggy dog story of a tale, but I've only been thinking about it for 50 years and the mysteries were going on for 50 years before I ever became aware of it. Um, and yeah, the Sopwith Camel, it remains the most successful Allied fighter aircraft of the whole First World War, although 30% of its pilots crashed the first time they tried to take off. And it's credited with having killed more of its own pilots in training than the enemy killed while they were flying it in combat. And uh, back with another movie later, where we'll see how this fella, who was so literally illustrious that they made a bronze statue of him, managed to happen to turn this into that two days after the armistice was signed, leaving nothing but these two relics. What's left of the vertical stabilizer or the fin, and this enameled serial number off the cowling. Both of which are on display at Hilton College Pietermaritzburg back in South Africa, where Durban Victor Armstrong was their most famously successful local yokel did done made good.
in the finest traditions of loyal imperial British colonials serving their empire. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Ciao.